Hello everyone and welcome to another video. The idea for this video occurred to me randomly this morning while I was in the shower, so cannot guarantee that it'll be the greatest video I've ever made, but hopefully it turns out halfway decent. Now those of you who are in touch with the chess world probably know uh, that the Pro Chess League, also known as the PCL, has uh, completed its second week of regular season action. The PCL is a uh, rapid team competition that's held on chess.com. It features some of the strongest teams ever assembled uh, across the entire world. A lot of the top players are participating. Magnus Carlsen, pretty unknown player, representing the Canada Chess Bros. Hikaru Nakamura is also playing for the Gotham Knights, Levy Rosman's uh, New York team. I'm also playing for my hometown team, the Charlotte Cobras. Unfortunately, we have lost our first two matches, and if you lose three matches in the regular season, you're out of the PCL, so our back is against the wall, and we're going to keep fighting next week. You should definitely tune in. The matches happen Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and I will link uh, in the description to this video an article, an informational article that contains all of the info and schedule that you need to know. It's broadcast on Twitch and on YouTube. I'm mostly commentating when I'm not playing. So the PCL definitely worth a watch if you haven't already tuned in. But the point of this video isn't just to shill out for the PCL. I think there's also an instructive component. Now, what I've done for the last couple of hours is sift through all of the games from the first two weeks with an eye toward finding some of the most instructive end games. In particular, I like the end games that occur in rapid games because both players, by the time move 40 rolls around, usually have just a couple of seconds on their clock. So you actually see a lot of very strong players committing uncharacteristic mistakes in the end game, which they nor they wouldn't make if they had more time on the clock. We know that the best way to learn is from the mistakes of others. It's a lot more painful than learning from your own mistake. So what I've done for this video is assemble the five most instructive and most entertaining endgames that we saw in the first two weeks of the Pro Chess League. We're going to look at these endgames one by one. Uh, these aren't just pawn endgames or rook endgames, endgames of various kinds. My endgame series is still going to continue. Uh, so this is kind of a supplementary video that will hopefully give you uh, some more general advice on playing the endgame. I play my cards right. Hopefully both more advanced players will benefit as well as newer players. I'll try to share uh, a couple of general pieces of endgame feedback, and I'll give you plenty of opportunities to pause the video and test your tactical skills and, of course, your overall endgame skills as well. So we'll get through as many games as we can. I have five prepared, but if the video is going too long, we might only get to three or four. So without further ado, let's jump in and start with a pretty basic, but nonetheless very instructive example. And right before we jump in, just wanted to clarify that I don't have the time to cover every single detail of these endgames, so I absolutely encourage you to analyze along with me. If you have questions, you can leave them in the comments, but you can also analyze with an engine. So I will gloss over some variations that otherwise I would include just because I want to kind of get through the main points. I want to hit on the main instructive points of each game, and I want to get through as many games as we can. So here we go. Our first example is an endgame that happened in a game between a very strong Indian Grandmaster Narayanan, who was facing international master De Monte Cornet. And Cornet had played a fantastic game, defending uh, against a raging initiative for like 30 moves. And by move 44, they reached the endgame that is in front of you. This is a same colored bishop endgame. Obviously, we haven't gotten there yet in my endgame series, but... You evaluate these types of endgames much the same that you would any other endgame, like a pawn endgame or rook endgame. You calculate the material, you take a look at which side has the more active pieces, and you examine both sides' potential for creating past pawns. And this is a pretty elementary type of endgame, because the pawn structure is largely symmetrical on both flanks. Neither side has the capacity to create a past pawn. But it's very clear that white has the domination when it comes to peace activity. White's pieces, both the king and the bishop, are a lot more active than their counterparts, particularly white's king, which is oh so close to infiltrating either the queen side or the king side. Black's king is just holding white's king at bay. Uh, the kings are actually in opposition. 
White's bishop is also more active than its vis-a-vis -vis because it's pressuring the f7 pawn. That is a long-term target. When you're looking at same colored bishop endgames, you want generally want your opponent's pawns to be on the same color of your bishop because then those pawns are a lot easier to attack. And if black's king steps away, then white wins the game immediately with king, F king f6 picking up both of the king side pawns. But of course, all of these general considerations are subsumed by concrete analysis. And often what happens is that you look at an endgame and you feel like one side is, has got to be winning because the pieces are much more active, but you actually have to calculate concretely. A fortress can completely nullify all of these general positional considerations, which is actually the case here. For all of white's advantages, there is absolutely no way for white to infiltrate unless black is forced to move her king. And black is not forced to move her king. Black has a bishop. The bishop has plenty of squares. And all black has to do to draw this game is just shuffle the bishop really on any square, as long as you don't allow white's king to infiltrate d5 and c6. So bishop b7, for example, is uh, perhaps the easiest way to draw. White is powerless, right? Bringing the king back doesn't help because c5 is uh, covered by the pawn. B4 is futile as well. Black will simply trade and play a move like bishop c6. That doesn't help. The only tricky move that white can try is bishop d5, offering an exchange of bishops. And as you'll see in the knight endgame videos, bishop endgame videos, another very important aspect of good endgame technique is the constant evaluation of what happens in the event that the minor pieces are traded, right? You always have to keep your peripheral vision on who benefits in the event of a pawn endgames because trades are so common. And here it may appear that white has to be winning in the pawn endgame, but in fact, white isn't. Black can draw by declining the trade with a move like bishop c8, but even taking on d5 results in an immediate draw because after king d7, black maintains the opposition. It may seem that with a move b4, white is forcing black into Zugzwang because after ab4, ab4, black runs out of waiting moves. Remember from the uh, pawn endgame video, black has to move her king. If b5, then of course king c5. But the specifics of the position, again, always supersede these general considerations. And it turns out that after king c7, it's actually a pretty elementary draw because white cannot go king e6. The f7 pawn is the unsung hero of black's entire defensive construction. White has to take the roundabout route, but black is in time to make it to e8. You don't care how passive your king is. White has nothing to attack. King g7 is similarly futile because after king e7, doesn't matter who has the opposition. Black will just shuffle between e8 and e7 ad infinitum. White will never be able to play h5. And even if white, quote unquote, gets, gets the opposition, it's not going to matter. Because if white drops back to f6, Black then reclaims the opposition and pursues White's king to the edge of the world. No matter where it goes, Black's king is right there, and this is an obvious drop. But Cornet, with just a couple of seconds left on her clock, makes a very understandable move. And this move violates a rule that my coach shared with me many, many years ago. It's a rule that sounds incredibly general. It, it sounds vacuous. It sounds like it, you know, is this really uh, an effective way to play the endgame? And yet it is, right? My experience has convinced me that this rule is incredibly enduring and effective across a wide variety of endgames. And the rule simply states that you should not move unnecessary, uh, you should not make unnecessary pawn moves in the endgame. Put another way, every pawn that you move in the endgame, you should have a clear reason that you're moving it. And creating a one move threat is not a reason. Grabbing space isn't really a valid reason to move a pawn in the endgame. And the reason that you have to be so careful about pawn moves is because they're tremendously weakening when you don't have a lot of pieces left. When you move a pawn in the endgame, you are by definition weakening squares, but more importantly, you're often bringing the pawn onto a more vulnerable square. The further the pawns go from your side of the board, the harder they are to defend. And when you don't have a lot of pieces left, you might end up losing those pawns. This is exactly what happens here. Cornet plays the move b5. And this is a decisive mistake because it puts the pawn on a light square where it can be much more easily attacked not only by white's bishop, but also by white's king, because a pathway has now opened up to the queen side. So this both makes the pawn more vulnerable and allows white's king to infiltrate black's weaknesses with king d5 and king c5. First, of course, white will have to get this bishop off of c5. The second thing that it does is that now every pawn endgame is going to be losing for black. And so Narayanan responds with a very accurate move. He plays the move bishop d5. 
Now the situation has changed. And in the event of the trade, white is just going to reach c5 and black will lose either one or both of her queenside pawn. So for example, king d7, king c5, and black can try to initiate the pawn race. But this is like, you know, a Ferrari racing against a Ford. Black is not even close. And very importantly, anytime black plays f5, white takes on Poisson. This is called a deep freeze. The g5 pawn is deep freezing black's uh, f7 and g6 pawns, making it incredibly difficult for black to even get a passed pawn. So the pawn endgame is now out of the question. Cornette is forced to move her bishop back. And now the second very important phase of white's winning strategy. Pause the video. This will be your first endgame task. This is a move that is automatic for good endgame players. But again, you shouldn't feel bad if you get a move wrong because that's the whole point. That's why you study endgames. So see if you can figure this move out in just a couple of seconds. So in same colored bishop endgames especially, when you have an opposing pawn that's on the color of your bishop, that's an incredibly valuable asset, and you want to make sure when possible that things stay that way. This is what white does with the move before. This fixes the pawn on a light square, right? It's hard to shoot at a moving target, and here the pawn will be totally immobilized, and all that white has to do now is clear the pathway for the king. Once the king reaches c5, the bishop can drop back to the f1 a6 diagonal. White will pick up the pawn and win the game. And that is exactly how things unfold. Black is totally powerless because she is too passive. After the trade, Cornette waits around with bishop e8. White drops the bishop back. And there are some interesting subtleties here that I could delve into, but we'll skip. So here, for example, the most direct way to win would have been the immediate king d5. Uh, but Narayanan was a little bit worried that black would essentially trade all of the kingside pawns. And once that happens, even if white will win the b5 pawn, which he will, remember that if there are no other pawns left, then black could try to give the bishop away for white's last remaining pawn. King and bishop versus king is a draw. So Narayanan shuffles his pieces around and avoids this scenario. He first plays bishop e2. He gets his bishop around to d3. And only now, after Cornette moves her bishop back, king d7, by the way, would have been a little bit more resilient. But then the king would have infiltrated f6 and white is still handily winning. But after bishop d7, king d5, white has avoided the situation. If black plays f6, then white takes on g6. This is, in fact, what happens. And now white actually keeps both passed pawns alive. f g5, h g5. Now the king slides over to c5. The bishop moves back to d3. And black is unable to get to g6 with her king. If black's bishop moves away from the diagonal, then white captures with the king. And if white, if black stays in the diagonal, then white takes the pawn with the bishop, and because the bishop is hanging, black is again unable to reach g6. This is what happened in the game. White returned to d3, and Cornet resigned the game because the b-pawn is just going to run up the board. The final detail that I wanted to share is an option the black had after king to d5. So you might have noticed that rather than playing f6 and simply giving up the pawn, black could have tried to create a passer with f5 and forced white into taking on Passant. But in fact, white has an e even easier approach here than taking on Passant, which does win. This position is winning, even though, even though black is able to trade all of the pawns, you can convince yourself of this by using the engine, but white is essentially able to roll out the red carpet. We will analyze these types of bishop endgames at length in a subsequent endgame video. But even simpler in this position is actually to go back to e5. Then white's plan of action is very simple. Black has to stay on this diagonal to keep the pawn defended. The bishop drops back to e2. Now moving the king is out of the question because white infiltrates either to f6 or comes around uh, to c5. So black has to stay with the bishop. And now white pushes h5. This is a simple breakthrough, breaking down black's pawn chain. That's all there is to it. And on the next move, you are going to go around and pick up the pawn on f5 and essentially get the same type of position that they got in the game. Black has to simply wait around, bishop g6, and that's it. White takes on f5. The pawn endgame is losing, and here the simplest is just to get the king over to c5, much like white did in the game and pick up the second pawn. So f5 was slightly more resilient, but here white could double back to e5 and win the kingside pawn first. In the game, Black played f6 and gave up the pawn. But all of Cornette's problems in this endgame stemmed from that decisive mistake in the initial position. So do not push unnecessary pawns. And particularly in bishop endgames, you should be very sensitive about putting your pawns 
uh, on squares where they can be attacked by the opposing side's bishop. From white's perspective, I think the most instructive was, first of all, to offer the bishop trade, right? When a pawn is pushed, the situation changes and you should reassess what happens in the event of a trade. But also as important was the move before fixing the pawn on a light square so that you can more easily attack it with your pieces. And in this way, Narayanan was able to win the game. Okay, on we go to our second end game. And th these end games won't have any particular order. I want to give you a, a wide variety of interesting end game positions. So let's examine a more tactical end game. Now, what's funny is that I was commentating this game live. This was a game between Karina Ambartsumova, uh, international master, and V Pranav, uh, a newly crowned grandmaster from India, who some people who are watching this should be familiar with. I've played him a dozen, hundreds of times probably by now in Blitz. Super, super talented player. And Pranav has the black pieces here. And he is completely winning. He is technically down an exchange, but he's got two pawns for that exchange. But all of that doesn't matter. Look at this pawn on d2. It is a passer. And what stands between it and promotion is this miserable rook on d1. Black's pieces are maximally active. And the winning approach is, of course, to dislodge the rook from d1 by attacking it with the knight. So that's exactly what Pranav does. He plays the obvious move knight to c3. Now, as a sneak preview, you can see the question mark popping up on the screen. So you know already that something is wrong with this move. Is there a way to do the same exact thing, but from a different angle? Well, yes, there is. The move knight f2 does indeed win the game for black. If the rook moves, then black simply promotes and emerges up a piece. If black does not react, then white does not react, then black takes the rook and wins easily. The quote-unquote most resilient move is queen b7 check, but this is a paper tiger because the king is able to hide out on h6. And most importantly, consider the placement of black's queen. It's placed on an ideal position, both from an attacking, but also from a defensive perspective because it's guarding the h8 square. So black can safely take white's rook and has nothing to fear on the king side. White has one check. It can be easily blocked by the queen. And here, white is simply out of checks. But most importantly, this would be checkmate were it not for the presence of black's queen. So you should actually keep that in mind because it becomes very important in just a couple of moves. What could possibly be the downside of doing the same thing from the other side of the board? Well, once again, white's hand is largely forced. And Amber Tsumova, with her last seconds, finds the correct move. She gives the check on b7. But after king h6, we seem to have the same exact scenario. Who cares whether the knight is on c3 or f2? It doesn't change anything. Black's queen is still on the same spot, but this really is the beauty of endgame tactics, right? Even more so than middle game tactics, endgame tactics really often don't subject themselves to intuitive logic. Your intuitive part of your brain could be screaming that one thing is the case, but the tactics often show otherwise. And here, it turns out that there is a beautiful, beautiful difference between the placement of the knight on f2 and on c3, because here white gets an additional defensive resource, which actually forces black to be the one to find a series of only moves in order to draw the game, as crazy as that sounds. So great time to pause the video and figure out the hidden resource that allows white to turn the tables. So the best way to solve a puzzle like this is probably process of elimination, right? You literally just consider every legal move. And we already know that a move like queen c8 does not do the trick. This literally transposes into the same position we had from uh, the knight f2 variation. So the only difference is that here the knight and the queen are aligned and white is able to pin the knight with the crazy move queen b2 which I think is a move which may have even occurred to Karina. It's not a particularly challenging move in and of itself, right? You're pinning the knight, which means that knight takes d1 loses the game because black drops the queen. But subconsciously, it's very easy to rule this move out because black has, of course, an intermediate check on f2. And after the king moves, the knight safely takes the rook and black wins the game. Wait a second. What was the queen doing on d4 in that other line? Well, guess what? It was guarding the h8 square. Here, white literally has mate in one. Queen goes from, where, where was it start? Where did it start? It goes from f3 to b7 to b2 to h8. Ridiculous geometry here by the white queen. And after queen f2 check king h3, in order to draw the game, black actually has to find the move queen to f3. Everything else <laughs> loses because if you play some other move, 
if you play a move like queen e3, then white, again, goes to b8 and starts hunting the black king down. This threatens mate on h8. If black tries to defend, then the deflection sacrifice wins the game. Rook takes d2 is really pretty. Queen d2, queen h8 is checkmate. And if black defends with the king, then white zigzags her way, first to c7, then to d8. What's the idea of the staircase? Well, now you can pick up the pawn on d2 because the queen and the rook are linked up. So in this position, black has to find the cold-blooded move queen f3, which allows white to draw in a variety of ways, the most clinical of which is actually to still go to b8, threatening the mate on h8. And black has nothing better than to force a perpetual check with queen g4 and queen e2. Don't go back to the first rank because you give the rook away with check. Black has nothing better to do. King g7, again, loses to the staircase mechanism. So black would be the one who would have had to be precise after this incredible move, queen b2. And what this teaches us is that, well, as much of a cliche as this may sound like, you really should never give up in the endgame. I think a lot of players, they tend to associate endgames with lack of resources, lack of defensive resources. And you may think of the endgame as a phase of the game where it's much harder to trick your opponent. And partially that's true, but that doesn't mean that tactics or mating ideas are absent from the end game. And when there are queens on the board, there are always mating patterns. That is just a thing you should hammer into your head. And can we blame Karina for missing queen b2 with three seconds? Absolutely not. I would have never found this move. But nonetheless, it exists and it teaches us a lot about the abundance of tactical resources, even when they appear to be least likely. Karina played queen h1. And after knight takes d1, Pranav was obviously able to win the game. He delivered a check on f2 and played queen e1. It would be nice if the queen could teleport itself to the... I guess that wouldn't have helped, because now black has the equivalent mate on h1, and black made a second queen, easily dodged the checks, and won the game. So really, incredible tactical resource in the unlikeliest of moments. Okay, on we go to our next example. This one is also very, very tactical and very pretty. It is a game that occurred between two of the stronger teams in the PCL, the Garden State Passers, uh, who have Samuel Sevian, their board one, and uh, the Levitov Chess Wizards, which is composed of a lot of very strong Russian and Belarusian GMs, one of whom is Denis Lazovic. He's a very exciting young player from Belarus. 2541 is his rating, but you can toss that into the trash can. He's definitely over 2600 strength. So in this game, Lazovic has black against Sevian, and they've reached the pawn end game that is in front of you. It is black to play, and once again, as is going to be the case in all of the end games that we are examining today, both sides are in acute time pressure and have mere seconds to make very complicated decisions. So I'll make it a little bit easier for you. The big question here for Black is between keeping the status quo, which essentially means doing nothing. And what that means in a pawn endgame is moving the king. We've already learned that you should avoid unnecessary pawn moves. So the default move is king back to e7. But of course, if you've watched the pawn endgame videos carefully, you should already sense what the big worry here is for black, which is that the black king being more passive than its counterpart and being the king that is in opposition is going to get shouldered. It's going to get zugzwonged continuously, and white is ultimately going to make his way to the king side and pick off black's vulnerable king side pawns. He's going to do that by playing king to c7, black again, is in Zugzwang, right? If the king goes back to e8, then white drops back to d6. This is shouldering, vice versa, king e8, king e6, king d8. And uh, if black continues to dilly-dally, well, there we go, right? King e6, uh, king e8, and king f8, and white is already winning the game by bringing the king down to g7. But upon closer examination, you should realize that black is not entirely powerless. Black has a lever that he can pull and he can pull it in a variety of different moments. And that lever is the pawn breakthrough f5, forcing a mass trade of pawns and transforming the position into an entirely different type of pawn endgames. Lazovic decides to pull the lever in the initial position. He plays the move f5 here. And we will start by considering how the game unfolded. Then, when we finish the analysis, we will go back to the initial position, and the correct approach will make a lot more sense once you realize why the move f5 should have been a decisive mistake that lost Lazovic the game. As we will see, there are many more adventures to be had here. Well, white has to start by trading, initiating the trades, right? White cannot ignore, because then black will take and create a pass pawn of his own. So white has to trade, 
And again, if you ignore, then black will play f4 and e4, and white will simply lose the game. So Savian accedes to the trades, and we, we reach this position. So it's easy to get overwhelmed in these types of pawn endgames because there's a lot of directions that the king can take, right? And it gets complicated, but it's actually simpler to break this down than it appears. This is a pawn race in the making, and the reason I see that quickly is because with his next move, king to d5, white gets opposition and will ultimately try to dislodge, to dislodge black's king away from its protection of the e5 pawn using Zugzwang. Black's only counterplay in that case will be to go after the h3 pawn. If both of those pawns are liquidated, we are going to get a pawn race between the e pawn and the h pawn. But before we get that pawn race, both sides have a series of waiting moves that they need to exhaust. And this is exactly what happens. Lazovic plays the move e4, pushing the pawn forward. But Sevian freezes the pawn with e3. And hopefully you can see where this is going, especially if you watched the video on pawn races and waiting moves. Black has only one waiting move remaining, that is h5, and white completes his waiting moves last, forcing black into Zugzwang. h4 is played, and black's king has to abandon the e4 pawn. Now, I should note that something similar would have happened if black had started with h5 here. White can play h4, reaching essentially the same position, or white could start with e4 check, and after king f4, force Zugzwang with h4. And again, you get the same position from the game. Instead, Lazovic pushed e4. Not exactly the same position, but uh, the nature of the pawn race will be uh, essentially identical. Well, black has to take the plunge and play king g4. Sevian captures on e4, and black captures on h4. Now, the first thing that you need to do in a pawn race is simply count the tempi, whose pawn is further advanced. Well, mathematically, black should be the first one to promote in a pawn race. Like, if you calculate abstractly, white moves the king, black moves the king, e4, h4, e5, h3, e6, h2, e7, h1. Incidentally, I put the white king on d5, where black will promote with check. But clearly, black should be on the aggressive side of the pawn race. Black should definitely not be losing here. But you might remember that one of the crucial rules of pawn races is to not forget that you can use your king not only to assist your pawn, but also to obstruct and slow down the progress of the enemy pawn. This is particularly true when the opposing side has a corner pawn and the king is stuck in front of the pawn. The black king cannot move to the right side of the board. There is no right side of the board. And so the savvy winning move is king e4 to f4. You're taking opposition, but that's not why this move is good. It's good because you're not allowing black's king to step away from the pawn. Black's king has to remain on the h file, and this gives white a very, very important tempo. Sevian uses this tempo to start the progress of his own pawn. Lazovic does the same. And here we reach the critical position of this game. Again, there were about five seconds on the clock for Sam. He took three of them on what may seem like the most natural move possible, right? Your hand is reaching to make this move, and yet there is only one way to move, uh, only one way to win, and it involves making what, to me at least, seems like the most unnatural move, especially if you start calculating. And therein lies the beauty of pawn endgames in general, but this endgame in particular, because it illustrates a very, very instructive idea uh, that you have to understand if you want to handle pawn races successfully. So pause the video. This is a big, big moment. Let's see if you can improve on Sam Sevian's play and find the winning approach. Built some water on my phone there. <laughs> so I'm kind of regretting saying that, you know, the correct move is unnatural because natural means different things to different people. So hopefully you were able to toss that in the trash. There are two logical candidate moves for white. The first is to push the pawn. The second is to try to keep black's king caged in with the move king to f3, maintaining opposition and trying to buy yourself as much time as possible for the progress of your epon. And Sevian makes this move. He plays king f3. And to me, this move seems more natural because there doesn't appear to be a downside of the move king f3. You're just forcing black's king further down. And if you look at this position carefully, you'll notice that king g1 can be met with king g4 and white picks up the pawn. So we're home free, e5, except we're not home free. The problem is that black pushes his pawn down to h3. And if white continues to keep black's king boxed in, yeah, congratulations, you're going to stop black from promoting. But what, what's going to happen a scenario that we did explore in the pawn race video 
is that black is now stalemated. And in order to unstalemate black, you have to move the king away, allowing black to step to g1 or g2 and promote his pawn. And in that case, black promotes first and is able to eke out the draw. After e7, this is simply a stalemate. King g3, black plays king g1. And it's crucial that black promotes first. Because if white had promoted first, then obviously queen e1 would be checkmate. But here black is, tosses white's king away from g3 and makes an easy draw. So it turns out that king f3 is the move which gives away the win. And the correct move is the immediate e5. Now, how on earth does this work? Because, well, you're allowing king g2. And with his last seconds, Sam undoubtedly calculated to the position after both sides promote simultaneously. But it's crucial to remember that just because there are two queens on the board does not mean that the game ends. The first thing you need to do is look for skewers. You should be familiar with a lot of situations. For example, if Black's king were to be on d5 here, white would win the game with a diagonal check, skewering and picking up the queen. Here, the situation is different because the king and the queen are adjacent. So queen e4 check is not effective. It doesn't win black's queen. Black's king is able to stay pegged to the queen. But here, the win comes from a different source entirely. Turns out the black's king, when it's this close to the corner, and when the queen is this confined, there is a very important idea that involves forcing black's king onto the first rank and then actually making a quiet preparatory move, which will lead to inevitable checkmate. The most precise win is queen e2 check. The king is forced onto g1. King h3 results in maiden 2, queen g4 check, and queen g3 is a very pretty mating construction, uh, and one that is worth remembering because the queen is blocking the king's only escape square. So the king has to take the plunge, and now white plays the incredibly zen move king g3. And again, you should sear this position into your memory because it occurs very, very frequently in all sorts of pawn races, that liquidate into queen endgames. Black has no checks. Well, black does have checks, but all of them lose the queen. There are no stalemate tricks either. If black gives the check here, of course, taking with the queen would be foolish, but white takes with the king. Black has king h1. There is no way to stop the myriad of checkmate threats. No matter where black's queen moves, it might stop one checkmate threat, but there will be at least two others that will lead to checkmate. This is an obvious win for white. So a very instructive example of a situation in which, with just seconds on the clock, Sam decided that because the pawns promote simultaneously, it's automatically a draw. With just another 5 or 10 seconds, I think he would have understood that this is a win. Instead, he tries to keep Black's King confined, but remember that when you do that, and when your opponent has no other pawns left, there is always going to be the threat of stalemate. But we're not done with this position. Hopefully you're able to understand why White was able to win this game. He didn't win the game. Uh, how White would have been able to win this game? Instead, he played this extra move, king f3, and after king h2, e5, h3, the king steps into the checking zone of the h pawn, which means that black will promote with check. And actually, if white pushes e6 immediately, then yes, white promotes first, but here black promotes with check. This is the other important cor corollary of the move king f3. So it's not only a mistake because it allows black to stalemate his own king, but also because it steps into the checking zone of the h pawn, allowing black to promote with check and worm his way out of the confined space that the king finds itself in. So the winning move here was the immediate e5. Let's rewind back to the initial position where Lazovic pulled the plug and basically played the move f5. So instead, the draw was given by the move king e7. And we need to pause after king c7, king e6, and king d8. Right here, it seems that white is making great progress and getting the king forcibly to the king side. But in this very instance, it is the proper time to push f5. When the white king is the furthest away from the e5 pawn, that's when you force the liquidation of the pawns. And the reason should be pretty clear. If we compare this position to the position which occurred in the game, and the position which occurred in the game was this one. Here the king is on c6. There the king is on d8. So here the king is able to make contact with the e5 pawn in one move. But if we compare that to this position, here the white king takes two moves to make contact with the e5 pawn. Now why does this matter? 
Well, this matters because it gives Black an extra tempo to push the H-pawn as far down as it'll go, which is another rule of pawn races, which essentially states that when you're anticipating a pawn race, you should always try to prepare by pushing your prospective passer. It's a bit of a mouthful. Perspective is in future past pawn as far as it'll go. You should prepare yourself for the pawn race to uh, economize and save as many tempi as possible. Here, Black goes H5. White makes contact with the pawn, but Black is able to drive the pawn to h4. This is what Black was not able to do in the game. This is what Black was not able to do in the game. White plays king d5, and now Black runs toward the h3 pawn, and it's pretty easy to establish uh, that here Black is able to promote first and draws the game handily. If White plays in this position e3, trying to block the king's path. Well, then black draws with king e4. Now, actually, white is the one who has to be careful. It's still a draw, but black will actually end up winning the h3 pawn. So, again, if we compare this position, and of course, if white plays h4, then white loses because of king g4. So white simply is not able to do everything that he needs to do, pre prevent black from playing h4, make contact with the pawn, and push the e-pawn forward, that extra tempo is the difference between a draw and a loss. And that is what makes pun endgames so ridiculously, devilishly complicated. It's these minor differences, but appreciating these minor differences and really delving deeply into these types of endgames, I think they teach you a lot about how to play pawn endgames, and they help develop a pretty robust intuition because a lot of the time, when you reach an endgame like this, you just don't have the time to calculate and you're inevitably going to make mistakes, but you're going to minimize the risk of those mistakes if you develop a clear intuition about what is helpful uh, and how you should generally play in these endgames. So one of the key takeaways is that you shouldn't think in general blocks, right? It looks like Black's King is getting shouldered, but remember that you don't have to sit idly by. You can often push your pawns, not unless there's a good reason, but here there is a good reason. But you should try to do it when the opposing side's king is on the most inconvenient square. And often that involves forcing the king to initiate the shouldering process. And then once the king has reached the eighth rank, we push f5 because black takes the longest possible time to get back to black spawn. So it's a little bit of a clunky explanation, but hopefully you found this endgame pretty entertaining. I love me some pawn races and this is no exception. So we're down to two more examples. Let's see if we can get through uh, both of them. Okay, let's take a look at another bishop endgame. Let's take a look at another bishop endgame, which occurred in a game between two incredibly strong players, Bogdan Daniel Dejac, Romanian grandmaster, who's rated 2700 fide on the nose, and Georg Meyer, super solid uh, GM from Germany, who's beaten a lot of the top players. And, you know, the last time this guy lost the game was like 2003. But here, Meyer, who has the black pieces, is on the cusp of losing. And... That's obvious because white is simply up a pawn. White has an extra pawn on e5. Uh, and anytime you're up a pawn in a single minor piece endgame, well, that's generally a pretty good sign. But just a couple of seconds into looking at this position, you should understand that black is a fortress, right? Again, just like in uh, our first example, it's one thing to just say that you have an extra pawn, but that doesn't win you the game. You actually need to make progress, promote that pawn, or otherwise infiltrate with your king. And neither of those scenarios seems remotely possible. So why is that? Well, one of white's big problems is that the a-pawn is on a light square. So white can't just free roll with the bishop. If you make a inaccurate move, you're immediately going to allow bishop b3, and this is just an immediate draw. In fact, in order to draw, white has to immediately give up the e-pawn, to deflect this bishop back. Obviously, king e6, king g6, and white is fine. And after bishop e6, white has to play bishop d1. So one little careless move, and white is on the defensive. And that appears to completely hamstring white's ability to play for a win. The move h6 is okay. It seems to accomplish something, but that's an illusion because the white king cannot make its way past black's king on f7. In fact, black can shift the king to e7. Black can do it even now. And this king on e7 is on a dark square. It can never be checked, and it can never be dislodged, and it's very obvious that white has zero, zero progress to make. In fact, you already have to be careful because now black's king is suddenly moving up to e6. So it seems that the most, the wisest strategy is just to repeat moves. And that's what Bogdan Daniel Dejc does. He brings his king back, and they essentially repeat moves. This position is still winning for white, as we'll discuss, uh, but it uh, results in three-time repetition. They had previously had this position two other times, uh, which I haven't shown you, but this is where the game was automatically declared a draw by the server. But let's rewind 
to the initial position. White has an absolutely gorgeous winning sequence that once again hammers home the importance of being keenly aware of the role of tactics even when there are virtually no pieces left on the board. There's a ton of tactics in pawn endgames. In fact, pawn endgames are virtually only tactics, and we see that here as well. The winning approach involves understanding that the e5 pawn can be used as a decoy. Now, we saw something like that in our initial line. Here, white uses it as a decoy, but not because he's trying to win, because he's trying to avoid losing. But this concept is a very valuable one, because if black's king is forced away from f7, then white takes the pawn on g7, and the corner pawn is, is free to roam about the cabin. But how do you get a situation where you can play e6 without allowing black to take the pawn with the bishop? Well, this is where you come in. Let's pause the video and see if you can figure out the winning sequence. If you can generate more than just one move, if you can generate the entire line, uh, that would be particularly impressive. So feel free to take a couple of minutes here, uh, and I will, in the meantime, take a sip of tea and watch you guys torture yourselves. <laughs> I remember irrationally getting annoyed at my, my chess coach when he would give me a position and tell me it's 20 minutes of thinking. And then I could hear him making tea in the background and he would be putting lemon in and enjoying himself and probably watching Netflix on the side. And here I was laboring over the position. Uh, but hopefully these tasks are a little bit more enjoyable. The winning move is bishop g4. This should come to you naturally because when you have an extra pawn, the idea of trading bishops is very logical, and the pawn endgame is easy to evaluate. It is totally losing for black. In fact, you can win this several different ways. The easiest is just to go up and win the g7 pawn. You can also play king f4. So black has to avoid the bishop trade with the move bishop b3. Now step two is to use the pawn as a decoy. There it is. Now, here's the difference. The king has to, well, the bishop can take the pawn, but that allows the bishops to be traded. And again, white wins the resulting pawn endgame. So we're getting somewhere. We're forcing black's king back to f8. But step three, I think, is actually the hardest thing to see. White is playing with fire here because there is no longer any way to defend the a4 pawn. And you might say, oh, I get it. Let's get our king to g6. Let's get our king to g6. And then let's play e7 check and take on g7. But just because you have the pass pawn, does it mean you win the game? Remember that your opponent can actually give away the minor piece in many cases for your only remaining pawn. Here, white has another pawn remaining, but it's hamstrung, it's frozen, and black can easily reach it with his king. So after bishop c2, I think black is already winning. The engine kind of fluctuates here, but I'm pretty sure black is already winning. Because not only will you not be able to promote, but even if you win the bishop, black is now suddenly the one who promotes. White can't play bishop e6. So the common technique often is to play bishop h5 and bishop g6 and dislodge the bishop from the diagonal. But white is not in time because black plays a2 and promotes with check. So white actually loses in this case. So you would not really go into this line if you didn't see the subsequent move. And this is another opportunity if you didn't have a clear idea in this position to figure out uh, the brilliant follow-up tactic. And I'll pause for just a couple of seconds here as well. Okay, so the correct approach is another deflection sacrifice. Two deflections in uh, the span of five moves in an endgame. Here, this is a completely different kind of deflection. You're not trying to deflect the king. You're trying to deflect the g7 pawn, which is not permitting white to reach the f6 square. That's the promised land. So we now use the h pawn as the decoy. We're threatening h7. Black has to take. And the king moves into f6. And now e7 is totally unstoppable. Black can give the bishop away for the pawn. But here it's clear that white is winning because you're just going to win the remaining queenside pawns. If black does anything else, if black takes on a4, then the win is elementary, we give a check, and the king is on a light square, which is so, so valuable here because the bishop is able to dislodge it and white promotes a queen. Nothing that black can do in this situation. Bishop h5 is unstoppable. So bishop takes c6 is technically the most resilient, but it loses the game very straightforwardly as well. Uh, remember, as in... Uh, Basic point, but still important to note. You should never be afraid of a scenario like this and think that black will somehow be able to promote their pawn. You can always just give the bishop away for the pawn, especially if the king is as far away as it is from the queen side. I feel like I said that in a New York accent, a pawn. 
you should you know you should you should always you know you should be you know ready to you know, and and give up you know the bishop fourth warning much like I did you know against Korpov you know 1984 but uh, you know it's it's it, it, it's very important. Uh, so anyways, I got a little carried away there, but the move h6 is such a great illustration of the role of unexpected tactics in the end game and of the role of just thinking big, right? You might always, you always want to think in the form, okay, this is what I want to achieve. And this could be completely unrealistic, right? You should tell yourself, I want to get a king to f6. And you should not rule out that thought just because there's a pawn in g7, because you're often uh, able to do a lot more in end games then might seem to be the case because you don't have a lot of pieces left and yet your remaining pieces and pawns are often capable of great things as they are here the last thing i'll say is that black can try to stave off defeat with bishop c2 and the hasty h takes g7 check actually gives away the win because here of course the king is no longer able to infiltrate so all white needs to do is make the patient move bishop h5 which by this point should be pretty obvious the point is that after bishop d3, well, now you can play. There's multiple ways to win, but the simplest is to play hg uh, and e7. Of course, you're stopping king f7 and white promotes uh, the queen. If black plays gh, then you transpose back into the uh, the other mating line. So the win here is yielded first by using the threat of the bishop trade to dislodge the bishop. Here's deflection number one, forcing the king away. And deflection number two immediately afterward clears the path to the f6 square. There's the concept of mowing the lawn that I talked about in uh, the advanced topics pawn endgame video. And this is kind of similar where you use your pawns to clear a path for your king, which then enables your other pawn to promote to a queen. Okay, so we're at 46 minutes here. Uh, what we're going to do is go through the last example pretty quickly. I could talk about it for ages. Uh, we're not going to do that. I'm going to try to limit myself to five or six minutes. So buckle in. So I'm going to try to hit on the important points here. And our last end game is a battle between Jaime Santos Latasa, Spanish Grandmaster, and Oleksandr Bortnik, a good friend of mine, uh, incredibly strong blitz and bullet player. Many of you listening are probably familiar with that name. Uh, so Bortnik has the black pieces here. He also represents the Garden State Passers, uh, who have Sam Sevian, who we saw uh, just earlier on board one. Now, it is white to play in this position. Uh, Jaime Santos Latasa has the move, and he has the advantage. That part is obvious because he's got the only passed pawn. And he also has the capacity to capture the pawn on g6 if he so desires. But what you should notice here also is that black's king is quite far away from white's a pawn. So Jaime Santos Latasa, who was not in time pressure, he was the only player of all of the ones we looked at today who was not in time pressure. And ironically, he makes the fastest move of anybody. He takes two seconds on his next move, and he pushes the pawn up to a5. And amazingly, this ridiculously natural move gives away the win, right? How natural is it just to push the pawn forward? It seems self-evident that black is not able to stop this pawn. And yet this move enables Black to achieve a beautiful, beautiful draw, which Bortnik finds he was in serious time pressure, and yet he was able to find the drawing idea. So first, let's take a look at the draw. Then we'll rewind and consider how White should have proceeded. There is a very narrow path, actually, to winning this game. So what you should immediately rule out is a move like Rook to A2, because this is a lost cause. You're allowing A6, and ultimately... White is just going to go around with his king. If black tries to keep white's king at bay, then white starts mopping up the king side pawns, and you're not going to be able to give perpetual check here because the king will always be able to zigzag its way uh, behind the pawn. You're going to lose the g4 pawn, and uh, I'll leave this to you to figure out, but you're going to lose the game pretty straightforwardly here. So black needs something uh, with a little bit more meat on the bone. And the only source of counterplay that black has are the g pawns, but the g pawns are restricted, so by process of elimination, Sasha plays rook to g2. And he, he told me that when he played this move, he still didn't fully see how he was going to draw the game, but he figured he had no other defensive ideas. And that is a very effective method, especially in time pressure. White continues pushing. He takes the pawn. White continues pushing, and the game seems to be over. Because if black stops the pawn from behind, as you're supposed to do, white blocks the rook with rook a6. That's it. Black's pawn is one tempo short. G3, A8, Queen, stopping G2. And if Black gives a check, then the King steps away anywhere. And again, promotion is unstoppable. And yet it is in this position that Black has 
just an incredible resource, which is so easy to miss when you're calculating from a distance. Again, use process of elimination, and you should find this move very, very quickly. Pause the video, maybe for one last time, and see what you can come up with here. Okay, so there's literally only one other thing that you can do. Rook b3 check. A check can be such an effective method in end games, right? You don't even have to understand exactly what the check does, but it often dislodges your opponent's king, and that opens up a wealth of new defensive possibilities. So here's the rub. If white goes to c6, now black plays rook a3, and suddenly there is no more rook a6, white can play king b7. But now black gets the requisite tempo that he needs in order to push the pawn one square further. If white plays rook a6 now, then black trades and promotes simultaneously. Incidentally, black can also sack the rook immediately and the g-pawn secures the draw. This is a classic scenario. We will talk about this uh, in a dedicated rook versus pawn video uh, or multiple videos because these endgames can get very complicated. But here it's very easy to uh, establish that the threat of promotion forces white to give away the rook uh, for the pawn or or to keep checking but the king is always going to go back to the pawn uh when necessary uh and 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 threaten g1 equals queen so that is an elementary draw latasa finds the only way to keep the game going and that's king to a4 covering the squares on the a file bortnik has to take the rook and white promotes to a queen and you might be aware that queen versus rook is winning for the queen right it's a theoretical win but here there are these two additional pawns so I think a lot of players, when they if they have black here, would be tempted to just try to push the pawns. But that's actually the last thing that you want to do. First of all, because this blunders the rook. But even if it didn't, right, you're by pushing the pawns back to our initial endgame principle, don't push pawns unnecessarily because you're going to end up weakening them. If white can win one of the pawns, then likely he is going to win the second one. Bordnik plays the very level-headed move, rook f6. Common defensive technique. When you've got a rook against the queen, try to keep your rook and your king as close together as possible because that minimizes the risk of forks, as it does here. Latasa brings his king over. Bordnik swings his queen over to the g-file. And now comes the main aspect of this endgame. Black not only has a fortress, it's not one of those fortresses where, you know, you got to find a new move every time. Literally, Black's rook goes between f3 and f5. Between f3 and f5. It's a beautiful construction. It's so unusual. These doubled pawns create two anchor squares on the f-file. What's important about the f-file is that it keeps white's king permanently cut off on this side of the board. White cannot make any progress, and white cannot cause Zugzwang because every time he tries, black just shifts the rook from f3 to f5. There is no checkmating pattern because the king will always have the uh, g5 square or the h6 square or a some sort of square white has no way to set up a mating construction if white's king had been on g3 then queen h4 would be checkmate white's king can never get onto the f file and after a couple of useless moves santos thus is simply offered a draw there's nothing to play for because black can literally pre-move rook f3 and rook f5 until the end of humanity so it's just uh, again, demonstrates the resilience that you often see in endgames, even with like one piece left on the board. So if we rewind back to the start, the last thing that I want to mention is the winning line, which does in fact start with the only other logical move, and that's rook takes g6. Now, Santos rejected this move, I think, because he feared king f5, and he thought that taking this useless pawn on g6 would only lose some tempi for white and it would allow black to generate counterplay ironically that's precisely what he allowed with the move a5 here the winning move is actually rook to d6 simple idea rook g2 is just met with rook d3 right sometimes you want to make a couple of defensive moves and now the game is over now the game is over black can try to stave off defeat but ultimately uh, white can win this in a variety of ways, such as bringing the king closer and then blocking uh, the, the B file and then at the right moment, uh, the A file and the pawn is essentially home free. So that uh, doesn't uh, do all that much. There is nothing else the black can do. If he tries king e4, then the clinical move is actually rook d6 to f6. I really like this geometry. You go rook takes g6 to d6 to f6, cutting off the king and you're aiming for f4. You want to win the second pawn, which is going to make the winning task so much easier. Black cannot stop rook f4. Even after king d5, you can throw in a check to 
get black off of the opposition. Now you play rook f4, and that's it. Black loses the second pawn. And again, I'll leave it up to you to figure out how to win that ensuing position, but it's totally winning. So rook d6 is the winning move here. Rook to c6 may seem to do the same thing, but it allows black to give this additional check on b2. Here, if the king moves back, then black can play rook to g2, and the pathway to the c3 square is blocked. That is why only rook d6 wins the game, not rook c6, definitely not something like rook g8, because this simply blunders the pawn, much like white did in the game. But really, the highlight of this endgame is that a move as natural as a5 enables black to save the draw. Always remember, a check, even if you don't know exactly why it's played, can be such an effective defensive tool in the endgame. In this case, it dislodges the king, and no matter where it goes, black either stops the pawn from behind or, as in the game, wins white's rook and then sets up a beautiful fortress, a very unusual fortress that features two doubled pawns. I have actually never seen this before. I was flipping out during the commentary. And, uh, you know, you should never just assume that queen versus rook positions are always going to be winning. If there are a couple of pawns on the board, then you actually often can set up some sort of impregnable fortress. That is what Bortnik did in this game uh, to save an important half point for the Garden State Passer. So ended up winning their match against the Spanish Maniac Shrimps, who uh, my team, the Charlotte team, is facing next week. We go full, full circle. And on that note, folks, this video did go a little bit longer than I anticipated, but that's okay. Uh, we were able to go through all five of our instructive endgames. Uh, we started with a simple illustration of the uh, potential danger of making unnecessary pawn moves and creating additional weaknesses. Then uh, we took a look at a fascinating tactical endgame. Never underestimate the power of uh, your few remaining pieces to generate mating threats. Queen b7, queen b2 there uh, would, would have drawn the game. And then we looked at the pawn endgame uh, and discovered the power of timing the pawn advance correctly. You often want to time the pawn breakthrough uh, to the point where your opponent's king is on the most inferior square. Also, pawn races, simultaneous promotions, we had it all in this endgame. Uh, then we took a look at the double deflection that white could have used in this game to win, uh, e6 and then h6. And finally, we concluded with the rook endgame uh, in uh, no endgame video would be complete without a rook endgame in which white falls for the temptation of making a natural move. Always calculate, always look at each endgame concretely whenever possible. Hopefully you enjoyed this endgame exposition. Uh, I know that some of these examples were pretty complicated, but thank you very much for watching. The endgame series will continue as well with another knight versus pawns video. And if this video is well received, I am more than happy to do more of these kind of end game explorations from the PCL in subsequent weeks. Well, good luck to all of the teams. Make sure to tune in next week and I will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed.